Amen. How can you tell if someone is awake? I googled this this week, because that's what any sensible person does if they want to find out information, and I came up with a, a very helpful article with six points for checking if someone's awake or not. Number one, check their pulse. I can't remember what the range was, but if you check it in time, you can tell if someone's sleeping or not. Number two, check their breathing. How deep and how fast is their breathing? That will give you an indication of whether they are really asleep or not. Uh, number three, you look at their eyes. Even with the, the eyelids closed, you can tell if there's rapid eye movement going on, and that's a, a surefire sign of someone being asleep. Number four, and this is when I knew I must have been on the website of a preeminent medical journal, you check to see if they're snoring. Okay? <laughs> that is a, a good way of testing it. Unfakeable. Uh, number five, you whisper something really shocking into their ear. The building's on fire. Or um, your flies are undone. And ju just see what happens. They will respond if they're really awake. Um, and, and number six, it's my favorite, you flick them. I thought that was quite a simple way of finding out. Now, if I go on too long this evening, you can try any of those techniques you like on the people sitting next to you. But the reason that I give you this very tenuous introduction is because sleep, you will have noticed, being asleep, being awake, is the picture language that Paul uses to hold this whole section together that Luke read to us just a moment ago. And we see in there people who are asleep but will soon be awake, people who are awake and will never go to sleep, and even people who seem to be wide awake, but in fact, they're actually asleep. And so as we look at the tail end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, uh, we're going to see how Paul brings this all to bear on, on us as people who want to be followers of Jesus. Uh, but before we get too into this passage, let's just look, have a look at the first verse that Luke read to us and get a sense of what we're reading here this evening. So, so do have a Bible open if you've got one in front of you on your phone or something. And in verse 13, Paul writes this. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. This section here isn't about getting caught up and embroiled in controversy. And, and as we go through, maybe it will become clear to you why, why that could be the case. Some of the verses here have caused controversy and Christians falling out that kind of thing over the last couple of hundred years. But that's not why Paul writes this. If anything, in this letter, he's trying to avoid controversy. What he's writing is a letter to people that he really cares about, who are grieving and are struggling. And as a pastor, he reaches out to them in love. So, so that's what we have in front of us here. And can you see what the issue is? The issue is to do with those who sleep in death. The chances are that in this, this young church that, that Paul had spent a few weeks with and then was forced out, persecution, and drove him out of the city. He couldn't stay there any longer. The chances are that, that, that someone, maybe one of them or a few members of the church have died. And this has completely rocked the church because they weren't prepared for this. They didn't expect it. And so they're confused. And Paul is writing them to, to kind of talk them, pass to them through this confusing situation that they find themselves in. Somebody's died and they're unprepared for that. Paul says here in verse 13, they're uninformed. Now, now that could be a few things. No one's 100% sure in what way they were uninformed. I mean, the chances are when Paul was there, even for a couple of weeks, that he would have mentioned the return of Jesus. That, that was such a, a key part of the gospel that he preached that he, he couldn't have missed that. But maybe there was something about the relationship between Jesus' return and Christians dying that he, he failed to mention. Other things were more pressing. And, and so now they don't know what to make of this. What will happen to this person that we love who, who's died, who's passed away? Where have they gone? It, it could be, maybe, that the confusion is about whether this is God's judgment on them or not. Maybe this older man or woman in the church who's died, they fear is under God's displeasure. This is God's judgment upon them in some way. And they, they don't understand it. They can't make sense of it. Or maybe the possibility, and this is something that one of the commentaries I was reading uh, threw up to me, was, was that maybe they just wouldn't like for this person they really love to miss out on the return of Jesus. If they're kind of away somewhere, wherever they are, will they miss that glorious day when Jesus returns? The celebration, the excitement, will they miss out on that? 
So it could be any of those. It could be all of those. It could be something else altogether. But, but somewhere between the death of this person that they care about and the return of Jesus, there's confusion. And so Paul writes to them to try and make sense of this and to help these people who are hurting. And in verse 14, we see where he goes to help them. And it's no surprise for Paul. He goes right to the heart of the gospel. Look at verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. I mean, you can't get much more basic than that, can you? In the Christian faith, you can't get much more foundational. This is Christianity, Christian doctrine 101, isn't it? Jesus died and Jesus rose again. This is the heartbeat of the confession of the Christian faith, isn't it? And this is where, where Paul goes to make sense of this difficult pastoral situation. So Jesus died and Jesus rose. And in the rest of the verse, he, he just joins the dots to where they are and what they're feeling now. And so if Jesus died and Jesus rose, well, then tail end of the verse. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. It's the same logic that Paul uses so many times. We, we read it this morning, actually. If you were in church for the 915 service when I was preaching, we, we looked at 2 Corinthians 4. And Paul makes exactly the same connection there. That in the death and then the resurrection of Jesus, God has defeated death. God has raised Jesus victoriously from the grave. And if that is what God did then in Christ, then we have utter confidence that he will do the same thing for all those who are in Jesus. Just as they die like Christ, they will be raised like Christ. And here is the hope. This is the simple hope that, that Paul wants them to have. In the face of this confusion, they're uninformed, they're, they're struggling, they're grieving. But Paul says here, back in verse 13, I don't want you to grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. He doesn't say, I don't want you to grieve, full stop. He expects them to grieve. And gr grief is a, is a natural part of our experience. When we lose someone, there is a sense of loss. Of course there is. There is deep, deep sadness when that happens. But there is a marked difference, isn't there? Between the way that a Christian grieves for another Christian and the way that everyone else in the world who lacks hope will grieve. And it's right here in these verses that Paul makes sense of it. It's because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because this is an extraordinary hope, isn't it? An extraordinary hope that, that a Christian who dies is not really, fully, truly dead in the way that we use that word. And, and actually, it's a real shame that the NIV puts the word death in there. It's, it doesn't actually exist in the Greek in, in, this, in this passage. In verse 13, it just says, those who sleep. Now, now, I get what they're doing. They're making it clear because if, if you just read that, you might think he was talking about people who are literally having a nap. But, but he's not. He's talking about people who've died. But the language that Paul uses is just the language of sleep. The, these people are napping. It's a power nap, I think. Now, now I can't nap. I'm really bad. Anyone, anyone who can't nap is hard, isn't it? Sometimes you, I, I go to sleep and I wake up more groggy and the afternoons are right off and I'm grumpy. It's, it's, it's no good. But some people can power nap. Can anyone take power naps? Okay, a few of you, yeah? yeah? So, so you nap for like 10 minutes and suddenly you, you wake up kind of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you're full of energy and vitality and ready to go. And that is the image that we have here of these people. These Christians who've died, they are power napping. That's it. They are catching a few winks, recharging their energy, and they are going to spring to life at the return of Jesus, coursing through their veins with the resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead, and they will live forever. And that is the hope which, which Paul holds out. And I've seen this hope in action. I mean, the time I've been at Lansdowne, every year there are a number of funerals and faithful Christians go to sleep. But you see the way that their Christian family grieve for them. Yes, they grieve, but not like everyone else grieves. We, we call our funerals Thanksgiving services. We praise God for this hope. We await this resurrection because their life is not over. They're just napping. And so then Paul sketches it out a little bit more. This is all to do with the Christ who died, the Christ who rose, and the Christ who will come again. This, this foundational Christian confession. 
And in verses 15, 16, and 17, he tells us just a bit more about what is coming down the tracks, about the hope that we have. And these actually are the verses that, that tend to kind of you know, tee up a bit of controversy. And I'm hoping that we're not going to get into that too much this evening. But let's read them and then we'll, we'll talk about those verses. So verse 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who were left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. These are fantastic verses, aren't they? Uh, But these are verses that have divided Christians, and I really don't want that to be the case this evening. Um, I'm sure in a room this size with this number of Christians will have different interpretations of this. And maybe you've never really read these verses before or thought about the possible controversies that are here. Um, In case you haven't, and I don't really want to introduce you to a controversy, that's not a great thing to do, is it? But to give you a sense of the landscape, uh, what the reason these verses are sometimes Um, so prominent is because a lot of people go here to describe what they would call the rapture or or to be a bit more specific a a pre-tribulation rapture now you might hear those words and think what on earth are you talking about I've never heard that before in my life Um, some of you might be kind of intimately acquainted uh, um, acquainted with 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 these terms it makes a lot of sense to you you know all the arguments back and forth Uh, but essentially when people talk about this rapture what they're talking about is the idea that Jesus will return for a first, second coming that will be a secret coming. And in that moment, he will descend and kind of snatch up or collect up the the Christians um, and take them to heaven before a time of tribulation or trial or judgment uh, when things will be very bad on the earth. And after that period, there will then be a final second, second coming of Jesus one of judgment, one that everyone will see and recognize and hear. Now, that may seem very familiar. You're like, of course, that's what the Bible teaches. Or perhaps you hear that and you think, really? Do people believe that? There'll be a whole range of responses, I guess, in a a room like this. I have to say that I don't find that convincing. Um, I know there'll be people in this room who hold that view strongly and sincerely uh, and will look to texts in the Bible to support that. Um, we, we can talk about this afterwards. I'm sure there's a few people who'd love to chat to me or hit me around the head or something afterwards. But, um, but, but this isn't a view that I find convincing. Um, one of the reasons is I think there is such a strong insistence throughout the whole of Scripture that Christ will return once, um, that he will return, and in that moment he will comfort those who are his and he will bring judgment to those who've rejected him. I mean, literally just turn the page to 2 Thessalonians 1, and that's the view that Paul has there. And you can go to countless other places in the New Testament to find a similar point of view. Uh, the other thing is that passages like this, which a lot of people would say are the stronger texts for, for supporting that view, they don't really fit all that well. Um, so if this description here of, of the Lord descending on a cloud to, to snatch people up to him, to take them to heaven, is this first secret rapture, then that isn't really what we have described here. There's an archangel shouting. There are trumpets being blown. There's a a loud command. This is hardly secret. I mean, if you've read the Left Behind books, that would be a classic example of this view or or, or seen the movies. Um, You you know the scene, don't you? All of a sudden, just like that, all the Christians are gone. And there's piles of clothes and there's kind of shopping trolleys left and cars abandoned at the side of the road because instantly God has kind of snatched up all the Christians to himself. Uh, But that isn't what we have here. This is loud, this is public, this is something that everyone could hear or see. And so the way I understand this is that this is the final return of Christ, the second coming, not a first and a second, but the one and only second coming of Jesus. And actually, the the language that Paul's using here would, I think, be very familiar to anyone who lived in the first century. It's an event that would have happened quite regularly with with a city, uh, a dignitary visits, or a um, a king or a governor returns. And what happens? They don't just kind of rock up in their taxi and kind of get driven to their house. As they approach the city, people come out to meet them. 
and they line the streets approaching the city to welcome this dignitary or this king to the place where he reigns. Maybe after a victorious battle to welcome him back with celebration. Think about Jesus when he returns to Jerusalem in, in the triumphal entry at the end of the Gospels. People lining the streets as the king returns to the city where he will reign. And the same thing is happening here, but it, it's not just Jesus returning to a city. It is Jesus coming for the whole world. And what happens here is all of those who are Christians join together with all the others who've already run their race and are waiting for this day. And together, not with the Christians who've died being left behind or kind of missing out on this great occasion, they're brought together as well. And all together, all of God's people line the way to celebrate the return of the king who will establish his kingdom forever. And meeting him in the air, it's interesting, that word meet only occurs three times in the New Testament. <laughs> Scholars will tell you that it has almost a kind of technical um, meaning to it for that occasion, that that situation I've described of welcoming a dignitary or a king back to the place where he will reign. And that's exactly what happens in all the three um, examples we find in the New Testament. People are somewhere, they go out from that place, they meet someone, and they don't go off with them to another place, to heaven or to wherever else. They return to the place they came, accompanying the person they've gone to meet. And that seems to be what is talked about here. And so Jesus descends on the clouds. It's an allusion to Daniel 7, where God's chosen king, the one who will reign, the one who has defeated the rebellious powers of this world, the one who's seated at the right hand of God, he comes to take his place. He comes to reign, and his people are there with him. And where is the, the, the kind of the, 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 final, uh, the, the grand finale of this hope? At the end of verse 17, and we will be with the Lord forever. And so for these Christians who are worried about their departed friend, this gives them hope, doesn't it? That soon, very soon, Jesus will return, and they'll spend eternity with him. Soon, very soon, he will return. Their friend will not miss out. He will be leading the charge, the welcome party, as Jesus returns to take his place and to establish his kingdom fully and forever. And so in verse 18, it makes a lot of sense to say, therefore, encourage one another with these words. These are good news. This, are, this is good news. Encourage each other. But of course, as we move into the next chapter, everyone's asking the question. It's the question you'd be asking, isn't it? When? When's this going to happen? This sounds great. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Paul uses two really familiar images there to describe what will happen or how it will happen. These are images from the Old Testament, from the teaching of Jesus, of a thief who, who breaks in when you, when you least expect it, or a woman who goes into labor. You can never really predict when that's going to happen, can you? You can have the bag in the car, you can get your route to the hospital, but you don't know when it's going to happen. And that's the point that, that Jesus, sorry, that Paul is making it. Jesus made the point as well, but Paul is making the point that we don't know when it's going to happen. But, but Paul isn't really concerned about that, is he? Do, I mean, don't get the impression that he's bothered about when it's going to happen. What seems to matter for him is whether or not you are waiting, whether or not you're expectant, whether or not you are ready for that day. That seems to be the thing that really matters to Paul. And there are people here that he describes who aren't. People who don't know when it's going to happen, but they don't really care if it's going to happen or not. And what's their motto? Did you see it at the end of verse 3? Peace and safety. In the Roman world, that was basically the motto, the Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome, which was their best export. If you were part of the empire, then it meant that you could live quite a comfortable, peaceful life. But Paul is saying here that we shouldn't take the status quo as always being the status quo. We shouldn't assume that whatever it's like now, things aren't going to change. We shouldn't assume that Jesus isn't going to return, as so many people in our culture do. And so Jesus um, warns, and Paul warns, that we need to be ready, as though a thief is going to break in, 
as though our wife is going to give birth. We need to be prepared and ready for that moment. And Paul describes the opposite to those people who just apathetically say, nothing's going to happen. We're all fine. There's nothing to worry about. He describes the Christians differently in verse 4 and following. Look, look with me in your Bibles there. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You're all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. The only people who see the new day coming are those who've already woken up. And that is what a Christian is. Someone who's been woken up. I don't know if you've ever been seriously jet-lagged, maybe you've flown to America or somewhere like that, and your body tells you to wake up when it really shouldn't be awake. Everyone else is fast asleep, it's four in the morning, I don't know, 4.30, five o'clock in the morning, and it's pitch black outside. Maybe if you were to stare to the horizon, you see just the faint glow that gives you a, a hint that the sun is gonna peak above the horizon sometime in the next half an hour, hour's time. But it's basically nighttime. And just a few of you in the city will be awake at that point. Most people will be snoring their heads off, fast asleep. And that's the image here. Paul says that the Christian is like that person, not because they've got an out-of-sync, jet-lagged body clock, but because the Holy Spirit has woken them up. Woken them up to anticipate the new day of the Messiah that is coming. Woken them up to welcome the dawn when Jesus returns. And, and so this evening, if you are a Christian, you are someone who has been woken from your sleep by God to anticipate that day. And it's only us who are awake who will expect the day to come. It's only us who are awake who won't be caught off guard and surprised when that day comes. Because the sun will rise, the new day will come, the dawn will break. It's inevitable. But those who are awake, those who've been woken from their slumber are ready. And that is how they're described here. That readiness is about a change of lifestyle. I mean, you see here some of the hints that he gives, the kind of things that people do at night. You, you're grown up, so you can use your imagination, can't you? Those kinds of things. We, we don't dabble in those kinds of things. We live like people of the day. We, we adjust our behavior because we're not living for the nighttime. We're living for the new day of Jesus' kingdom that is coming, that will be here soon when the sun rises on that new day. We live for that day. Our behavior is set for that day. We're changed people becoming more like the way we ought to be for that day. We're on our guard because we know the dangers that exist. I mean, there's this mini um, armor of God here, isn't there? A bit like you get in Ephesians. Just a helmet and a breastplate here, for that'll do you some good, won't it? Faith and love and salvation. Uh, but most of all, this picture of someone who is awake is a picture of someone who is ready. Someone who is anticipating the new day. A Christian is someone, I think, who every day of their life, they're straining their eyes, scanning the horizon, waiting for the return, waiting for the sun to rise, waiting for the dawn to break, because when that happens, they'll be ready. And every day, every hour, they live their life anticipating that day. There's a couple of different people that Paul talks about here, isn't there? Probably a few more. But two I want to just draw our attention to at the end. There are those who, at the moment, seem like they're totally asleep. Those who've died in Christ. But actually, we find they're just power napping. They'll be back soon. Don't worry about them. Grieve for them. But don't worry. They're with Christ, and they'll be there when he returns. But there are also those who look like they're wide awake. But in reality, they are totally oblivious. And they're sleepwalking towards the wrath of God. 
And the challenge that Paul seems to give us here is to wake up, to be awake, to be the people who are ready before the sun has risen, anticipating the dawn, waiting for that return, to live as people of the day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the incredible grace that we've experienced, that you have woken us up. That by your spirit, we are awake now, ready and waiting for the day that is going to dawn soon. Lord, help us to be people who are seriously thinking about that day. Uh, People who spend each day of our lives with the soon return of Jesus at the forefront of our minds. Lord, we confess that often we live our lives as though Christ is never coming back. Often we are just as apathetic as the next person. So Father, we we pray for the work of your spirit in our lives. Please change our hearts. Please give us a sense of urgency. Lord, please help us to see the places where our lives don't match the day that is coming and need to change. Lord, please give us compassion for those people who are sleepwalking now. Lord, we pray for that kind of change in our lives this evening. And Lord, we thank you that one day very soon, your son Jesus will return. Thank you that with him will be all those who've died in Christ. Thank you that on that day, for us and for them, the resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead will course through our bodies and we will be changed and we will be with you forever. Father, help us to be people who encourage each other with that truth. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing.